Hello, and welcome to this Red Bull Bowl session on the Convent of Pleasure. Thank you all for joining us on this St. Patrick's Day. My name is Nathan Winkelstein. I'm the Associate Artistic Director of Red Bull Theater, and I will be the moderator for tonight's discussion. Um, I can't imagine that any of you don't know, but we did just do a reading of this play on Monday. Uh, it is available until tomorrow at 7 p.m., and then it disappears forever. So if for some reason you haven't seen it yet, you have until then to see it, or if after this you're so totally inspired to have other people see it, they have until tomorrow at 7 p.m. I have two guests tonight. Uh, the first guest is Liza Blake. She is an associate professor at University of Toronto in English, and she was also on our recent Cavendish panel that we did on March 7th, which you should absolutely watch if you want more extensive scholarship on the play. Um, hi, Liza. Um, and then my other guest uh, really needs no introduction, especially if you did see the play on Monday because she has introduced herself with her brilliant work. Um, it is Kim Weald, the absolutely wonderful director, teacher extraordinaire. Um, hi, Kim, how are you? I'm well, thanks. That's very uh, kind of you. <laughs> well, um, thank you both for joining us. Um, I personally uh, should say that Red Bull Theater operates on the ancestral lands of the Lenape people in New York City. Um, but neither neither of my guests are streaming in from there. So where are you guys? Where are you, where are you both beaming into to, from today? I'm coming from Toronto. Wonderful. And I'm beaming in from Pittsburgh, where I'm a professor at Carnegie Mellon University and the ancestral lands of many indigenous people and tribes here. Wonderful. Um, well, we should jump right in to tell you all who are watching how this works. This is primarily a Q&A, so I can view. Um, I'm going to you know, give you a peek behind the curtain because you're already seeing behind the curtain. It's just me. So <laughs> I'm watching the uh, chats on both YouTube and Facebook, and I will keep an eye on your questions. If you can keep the chats relatively clean for just questions, that will be helpful for me to be able to see while also being a functional listening host. So I appreciate all of you ahead of time. But if you do um, chat, if you do have any questions, do just write them into the chats and we will get to them soon. But to start off, I would love to ask Liza. So you hmm. had this wonderful seminar on Margaret Cavendish and on this play on the 7th. And now you got to see it. Um, uh, this, this play that was never really designed to be performed has just been performed. And I was wondering what, whether, uh, well, whether it surprised you or whether it was what you think Cavendish was imagining in her head, obviously barring the Zoom and OBS aspect, and how it, how it inspired or changed your opinion of the script. Yeah, I mean, I enjoyed the production so much. It was so, like, I've taught this play a lot. I've read this play a lot. I have a lot of thoughts about it. So it's interesting to see um, what what sort of matched the way that I normally think about it and what didn't. Um, and what was especially interesting for me watching this production, uh, watching any production, is um, what what the what the director chooses to do with the character of the princess who by the end of the play we think of as the prince right um because the only physical description that we get in the play is that the princess has a masculine pre presence a princely brave woman of a masculine presence um we know that she is accoutred in male clothing for a lot of the product for a lot of the thing um so was cavendish imagining a very masculine like cis man that wasn't fooling anyone? Was she imagining a genderqueer character? Was she imagining a genderqueer world where somebody shows up with a beard and says she's, she's a princess and everyone takes her at our word? Um, and it's, it's interesting too, because in the play itself, uh, the speech prefix just says prin throughout. And so it's actually, the character isn't marked as princess or as prince, it's just prin. Um, and in fact, doesn't change uh, as the play proceeds. And so 
uh, that's sort of the question I always have, like, what are we going to do with the prince slash princess? And I think um, uh, I really liked what this production did with it, right? Um, and then related to that question, in terms of how we see the prince performed is also the question I always have, which is, um, is Lady Happy in on it? Um, and one of my <laughs> One of my Cavendish buddies who was back channeling with me during the whole performance um, was like, oh my gosh, I think in this production, it makes me think that Lady Happy was in on it the whole time. Like she never thought it was a princess. She was just always in, um, always was ready to marry the prince. Um, uh, which is interesting because it's not something I've sort of seen in the play before seeing this production. Um, but there is that moment where um, Madame Meteor comes in and says, oh my goodness, there's a man in a convent, you are all undone. And the stage direction there says, they all skip from each other as afraid of each other, only the princess and Lady Happy stand still together. So in the moment where Madame Mediator says, there is a man in the convent, all the women run away from one another except the lady and the princess don't. Um, so is that signaling that at that point Lady Happy is in on it? Is that signaling that Lady Happy doesn't care? Is it signaling that Lady Happy doesn't suspect the princess could possibly be a man? Um, uh, I think that this production had a really sort of interesting answer to that question. Um, and all of these things that I was really interested to look out for and see what happened in this production um, come from what I think is sort of the biggest question that I still have about this play and that I'll probably always have about this play, which is, uh, does it have a happy ending, right? Um, and for me, the difficulty of answering that question comes from the fact that when I read it, I see the utopian vision with which it begins, all of the women splitting off, living a life of pleasure among themselves, not troubled with with heterosexual marriage. Um, I see that as like a queer utopian vision. Um, and then by the end of the play, it's turned into uh, what I think is usually read or cast as a like cis hetero marriage, right? Um, and so what do we do with the fact that the play ends in such a different place than it started? Is there a way of reading that ending as, as queer and not as just sort of breaking the queerness at the beginning? Um, and I honestly think that this production gave me a way of thinking about how I might answer yes to that question. Like maybe there's a way of imagining the ending as queer in a way that doesn't just like collapse the total vision of the beginning. Um, so I really enjoyed the chance to see that. It's always nice to get out of my own head and see it in someone else's. Um, and thank you so much for your wonderful directing, Kim. Yeah, and Kim, um, let me, uh, well, actually, let me, I, I mentioned a peek behind the curtain, so I'm gonna do one because I know she's listening. Becca, I just saw that you joined YouTube. I didn't know that you were here and available. If you would like to join the actual conversation, one of the actors is watching right now. If you would like to actively join the conversation, I just sent you a link in email. And if I see you join, I'll add you on. Okay, get rid of that peak. Now to Kim. Um, the, so I would love, I was going to ask you about the, the abstract elements of the play um, and how you, what, what as a director, as someone who is worried about how to make a play active and, and, work for character beats and, and character arcs, what you did with that. And I would love to know um, what your thinking was around those moments and how to attack them. But I would also love to know your thoughts on what Liza just said about, because I thought you, you did find some very interesting things to do about this innate tension between what seems to be an implicit queer utopia that then seems to get, pardon the pun, straightened out mm. into a cis marriage. Mm. or so we might think on first read and how you mm. chose to attack that and what your thoughts are on that. Um, oh, so much. Uh, so uh, first of all, I, I was really fortunate to have Liza working with us along with Misty Anderson, truly, um, and Christina Straub. But really, you know, to have Liza, just this amazing scholar who has been living with and in dialogue with Cavendish for much longer than me, because this was a completely new play to me. And um, 
you know, I think a part of a director's responsibility is to get inside the energy of a play. Um, there's all of the text analysis work to be done, um, but then also to be asking, you know, just what, what you said, that this play was never meant to be performed. It was a closet drama. And we did this sort of hybrid thing, which I'm beginning to think maybe actually Zoom might be a very good platform for closet dramas, to tell you the truth, because it's not a straight, it's not just a, a reading of a play and it's not a full on production, right? It's this yeah. other thing. And I think closet dramas are this other thing too. Um, at least in the 21st century. And I think that's the other question about, you know, well, one among many, what does it mean or to do this play in the 21st century and how do you do it? Um, and what did excite me about it was indeed the, the question of the prince princess. The, I was not interested in having it played by, um, no offense, but a, a, a cisgendered heterosexual <laughs> male. Um, yeah. Uh, um, Kim, we don't get enough roles, though. Yeah, I know, I know, I know. I'm so sorry. How did anyone think of this as way, man? <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, in part because we all have multitudes within us. And I honestly think Cavendish herself, right, she was this, from what I have begun to understand, and I do not, I do do not have the same knowledge about her as Liza. But um, what I have come to know and read up on her, she was an extraordinary woman who had multitudes in her, who was also cross-dressing, who, you know, um, and so uh, I was interested in, in experimenting with this, just like Cavendish was doing. And she was pushing the form uh, in, a, in a big way, even with a closet drama. Um, we've talked a lot about also the list that she has in there, that it's this post-dramatic structure. And, and I think a lot about a playwright I collaborate with, Charles Mee, Chuck Mee, and he does these lists as well. And just, you know, she was experimenting and that excited me. So then I asked myself and also the actors, you know, what does it mean to experiment with this and giving ourselves permission to make some very bold choices and kind of to go, go, go big or go home is what we did. And I have to say, cause we only really had about 10 hours uh, with the actors. They were extraordinary. And it's a testament to just, you know, them actually and their yeah. skills and, as one of the actors, um, Heidi said so eloquently that it, it it's uh, it's a form of skydiving that they're doing. Um, yeah. Well, Kim, it's almost like you can see uh, the backstage that I can because that was a perfect um, uh, way to introduce Becca, who has joined us. Yeah, so I'm going to add. Becca oh, no, wait, she just turned her. No, she's back. Hi, there she Yay, is. Becca. Hi, Becca. Hi. Oh no, you've I'll got a sideways that. turn problem. This is better. I'll just do that. I'm on my phone. This is better. Hi, thank you for Hi. Thank you for I don't know if us. I have much to say, but I'm here. Um, well, uh, no, we thank you for we were actually just um uh speaking which I think would be um something interesting for you to weigh in on as one of the actors. Um there is always the process in any reading that an actor is asked to do where it's like, mm -hmm. wait, I have how long with a script and then I'm supposed to somehow perform it fully for people. Great. This is amazing. And like that dive, but how it almost feels even more so in a form like this play where uh, at, at, there's kind of a go big or go home approach to this play. Um, how you, you, I thought had no problem at all deciding to go big rather than go home and make strong choices. How did you find as, as the actual practitioner, how did you find, um, 
uh, both attacking her, uh, Cavendish's language and this play, but also attacking these aspects of the play that are almost either non-theatrical or hyper-theatrical. These switches mm-hmm. into um, into being a sea nymph, the the switch into a pastoral, the complete change of style and um, and location. How did you find that as an actor? Did did that give you vertigo or was it exciting or some combination? (laughs) Take it away. Well, um, we were given complete freedom, which was amazing. And then enough direction to like sort of figure out, um, you know, every day I think I came in with something a little different according to the direction and then tried to, which I love, I love being directed. And and, um, according to sort of trying to match the energy of the other actors as well. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, and I just, I always, as far as the language is concerned, I always just try to, it changes, but I try to highlight what the important word is in the sentence. So I know how to, um, how to deliver it, but it, it changes sometimes once because because it's it's hard to listen sometimes when um, when you're still figuring it out, or for me anyway. So I was still discovering things. Um, the day that we did it, I really got a chance to really listen to everybody and um, and figure out what was what was going on because it is it is pretty sh- kind of Shakespearean language, um, and yeah. And the Scottish guy, I just figured out because I think he said he had a Y with a with a an apostrophe. So I figured I figured maybe I'd go in that direction. <laughs> yeah, you're Scottish or Welsh at that point? Right. Just jump in. Thank you. Um, we do have a couple of questions at this point from the audience that I think I will uh, toss in. Um, the first one is from Vivian Casper. I'll put it up. And Vivian asks, is there an influence from Shakespeare regarding cross-dressing, mistaken identity, and a happy ending? Um, she, uh, she also goes on to say that she meant to add that the play uh, actually does seem in some ways closer to Shakespeare mm-hmm. in, than to the wit of a restoration drama. It seems closer to Shakespearean form. Um yeah, can you can you speak a little bit to that, and then also perhaps Liza, maybe um, also to obviously the fact that it's an inversion of the form because that's always um, women pretending to be men, and now we get the the opposite. Can you speak to whether or not that was a reference to Shakespeare? Yeah, I mean, you could make everything a reference to Shakespeare, right? And we know that she read Shakespeare. Um, I think I've said this before, but the first critical essay on Shakespeare is written by Cavendish in her Sociable Letters. Um, And it makes me think of uh, Twelfth Night, where there is a boy actor playing Viola who is then pretending to be a boy, right? And so that's um, in the same way you have the prince pretending to be a princess who is dressing up as a man um you have that sort of double layering happening um so yeah i think there definitely is a lot of sort of shakespearean play in there um and were there just as a follow-up and kim you may know this too i'm I'm actually embarrassed to say that i don't where where did this fall in the like popularity of the pants role well because that there was definitely a time where the the woman dressing up as a man so that everybody got to see her legs, right? Was like, there was a, a pants roll thing, but which again, this is an inversion of, of, uh, but, but were, were they, were those in popularity at this time? Does anybody know? No, I mean, so Cavendish sometimes would um, affect masculine garb, but it was not a it was not a generalized trend that like a lot of women were dressing up as men. It's a little bit before that. Got it. 
But yeah, I mean, I agree with the point that it does seem closer to me to Shakespeare than it does to the sort of restoration wit, the sort of witty restoration drama. Um, and she does write plays like that. So she has a part three of The Blazing World, which is actually right after Convent of Pleasure um, in the second volume of plays that she publishes. And that one is very much like a comedy of manners. Uh, it's a sort of fragment of a play. It's unfinished. Um, so she can do that kind of drama, but she is not choosing to do that kind of drama with mm -hmm. Convent Pleasure. Mm -hmm. She does, I think, uh, you're absolutely right, look a little bit more backwards than she does to the present for, for current models. Mm -hmm. um, terrific. Uh, mm -hmm. Well, we have another question from um, this person I've never heard of named Christina Straub. <laughs> um, who, uh, I'll put it up, um, who wants to go to the ending. Um, and she, she puts this at Liza, but I'm, I am also curious what, what Kim's take is on this. Uh, uh can you talk about how mimics final, mm -hmm. one of the strangest characters ever introduced in a play? Um, can you talk about how mimics final speech and epilogue shapes the effect of the happy ending in a marriage, um, mm -hmm. of this play? Do you want to take it, Liza, first? Uh, I'm actually going to punt it to you because I am really interested about um, what to do with Mimic. Um, but I will also just note that Christina um, corrects me because she is way more knowledgeable about facts that are anything but Cavendish um, and says that women actually started wearing trousers on the stage shortly after they started acting in 1660. Um, so there was at least some of that potentially because Convent was published in 68. So um, there could be there. Yeah. yeah. I'm happy to hand Mimic off to you. Oh, gee, thanks. Uh, yeah, Mimic is strange and weird. And I thought Josh Tyson did a terrific job, actually, with Mimic. Um, because also what you see, Mimic is is like the, you know, saying an epilogue, an epilogue. He says, OK, what's, what's an epilogue? The thing inside of it, for me, was that, and I apologize for not having the script in front of me, but Mimic says to the effect, and I am paraphrasing, uh, that basically the playwright, if you like it, great. If the playwright, if, if you don't like it, the playwright doesn't really care. Uh, and it, it was a, it really struck me about she was, she, he, he sort of speaks, he's speaking for her and, and that it is this moment of um, her standing up for her work and basically saying, I'm experimenting, I'm doing my thing. And I loved that because that was also just great freedom uh, inside of that. I don't think, I don't think we felt precious with what we were making. I know I did. <laughs> if you see it, if you watch it, there's a lot that I was experimenting with. Um, but that speech too, you know, um, uh, yeah, I do not beg applause. Our poetess then will be enraged and kill me with her pen for she is careless and is void of fear. If you dislike her play, she doth not care. Yes, yes. So, yeah. Um, and, and I realize we probably should have given, again, I'm making the assumption that the people who are listening to this have seen the play, um, but they're like, who's this mimic guy? Um, which is the question. Um, but he's he he shows up only in the final scene and yet is given the epilogue. Correct. Um, yes. And on yeah, and we didn't spend time. I'll be completely transparent. We didn't ask that question. We just dove in and we're like... Yeah. Um, It is a really strange moment though, right? Because it um, the the play starts with so much Lady Happy. She has those really long speeches and it ends with this like really long speech by a character who literally just came in for the first time. Um, and even the sort of banter that Mimic has is no longer with Lady Happy, right? Um, he says, what road do you call me a fool? And then the Mimic starts talking with the prince and the two men together decide what's going to happen to the convent now that it's all over, right? Um, and so the, again, this is why I'm, I'm really sort of ambivalent about whether or not this play, like we're meant to like the 
play. Um, uh, Lady Happy gets married. She, as she worried, loses the right to all of her property. Um, and she, her husband debates with this random guy we've never met what's going to happen to her property. And then he sort of takes up all the air, right? Um, and after, then it says, uh, it, it doesn't, she doesn't mind if you don't like it or not. Um, then he says, but I mind. So be nice to the play for my own sake. Um, so is that Cavendish sneaking in that she cares a little bit through him or is like mimic a different kind of poet figure um, at the end? Yeah, I've never really known what to make of that speech, um, but it's, it's like fun to perform and it takes up a lot of energy. It's interesting to hear from from outside watching it. Um, it was interesting picking up. First of all, I found it very interesting that his name was Mimic, um, right? And that like, so is this even really a guy, or is it just this thing that mimics what it's supposed to be, and then gets handed something, and then is designed is supposed to mimic? every male playwright on the stage at the time who always does an epilogue where they say, please, please think my piece is good. Um, and and so and like that's how I've always thought about it is, is the male playwright saying, please like my play. Yeah. Um, I also do think I'm just gonna, again, peek behind the curtain. I think Eliza, your audio might be messing up a little bit. Could you try muting? Quickly, I've actually been muted this whole time in case it was coming from you. I don't think it's me. Maybe it's me. We're doing some figuring out. Maybe it's me. Maybe I should be. Let's see what happens. Oh no. It might have been me. Or did we all mute so now none of us know who it was? They, we're all very smart people, I promise. It might be me. Um. So then, uh, yeah, we don't have another question. So I'm going to hand one and then I'm going to fix my audit. Um, so, um, Becca, could you speak to um, find, oh, well, now it sounds okay, though. Could you speak to finding that, you talked about finding the layer or the level with the other actors where this play needs to sit. Is that, and maybe this is a question for Kim as well. Is that a conscious choice that the company talks about, about where do we, what, what, what world, what strata do we need to be in to make the, the language play? Or is it something that is more sort of found by, oh, this person's doing that and that's funny and this person's doing that and that's too much or that's too little and we end up finding it as a group. Could you talk about that experience of, because you found it. And you, y'all, to be honest, I got to see it. You found it, it grew during the three days, let's say. You definitely found it more by the end than you had at the beginning. Can you talk a little bit about that process? That's for Becca. Can you hear me, Beck? Kim, how about you? Question? It's for you. Oh, I'm having a real hard time hearing you. I'm so sorry. Okay, that's better, I think. I see. Uh, no worries, Becca. I think your your microphone might be having a little bit of trouble. Um, yeah, uh, no worries. I was asking about the level of um, the level of performance in terms of you talked about your style adjusting. Is this too painful for you? Should I change the question, or do you have it? The style of adjusting, and then what was the last part? I'm sorry. To, to match the script, like adjusting your level of acting to match the script and what that process is like. The level of acting. I'm about to give up. How it, how it matches the script. Yes. Um, um, is anybody else having trouble hearing? No, it, it's just you, Becca, right now, unfortunately. So we may, I, I may ask the question to someone else if you don't mind. Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll let you know when it when it clears up. I'm sorry. <laughs> Sounds good. Um, Kim, you heard the question. I did hear the question. So, you know, part of it, what absolutely 100% 
is about listening to the actors and their take on it and what they're bringing to it and how they're finding it. And, and you know, it was an incredibly smart group of people. So I think what happened is they were asking questions. And if you watched it, you also saw that we were playing with who has, who has the standard American accent, who's just doing, you know, naturalism or realism, those are two different things, but, um, and who's doing the British and, and multiple accents. And then finding each other uh, as we went through, as we were rehearsing, but in some ways making a leap together is eventually what they did and they held on to the leap and they committed to the leap and, and really holding on to each other inside of that was a beautiful thing. I thought, uh, and and that the energy and they were matching each other, right? And really gifted, skilled actors, that's part of what they do. That's part of the craft is, is being well met, is finding each other inside. Um, and that's what they did. And to to go along with that and audience, audience, um, please do ask questions because I've got a few, but I'm going to start sounding real dumb real quick. Um, uh, if, if not, um, the, the, just to go to the language itself of this play, how does this like, I don't really want you to feel like you have to make a one-to-one -one comparison of the language of this play to any other language, but I, how does it compare to other classical plays in its, its ease of performance in the amount of like, you know, work you just have to do figuring out what you mean versus why you mean versus all of that. Like, where does it fall as a performable script just from a pure language perspective? That was for you, Kim. Oh, that's for me. Oh. Um, I'd be curious. Yeah, you know, it's interesting because I, I keep going back to the, it was a closet drama, so it was meant to be read, I suppose, but I imagine that they were up on their feet. I think for me, I, I, I think part of what we did, it feels like a first pass at it. I would love to spend more time with it, with actors in a room up on their feet, because I think that there is something about embodying the language that is going to deeply inform it. Now the language, I am, you know, I am somebody who works with classical texts, uh, you know, and contemporary, you know, new plays. So I don't know if I'm the best person to be asking about how her language compares or stands up to, because that sounds a little bit like what you're asking, her ideas inside of it are huge. There is an expansiveness in her way of thinking that to get inside of that, and also to think that she was writing this in 1668 when it was published and what she was thinking, and also that she was a deist and Many people here probably know that also she was a royalist and that she also was um, uh, you know, she was a philosopher and she also uh, wrote about Adams. Right. So the ideas inside of her play, and this is why, I, I mean, it, I'll be frank, I, I, we just scratched the surface because we did not get to do the kind of text work on it that, that I would have, that normally we would have done. And we could spend months working at the table on this. Um, she has parts that are, I, I think we found were a little difficult to get out to, to speak at first, you know, they, they weren't, they didn't fall trippingly on the tongue, so to speak, you know, um, 
And so we had to break things down or change the, um, the punctuation a little bit. That was helpful. Then there are moments of heightened poetry that are absolutely exquisite. You know, these speeches that Neptune has, uh, or even the shepherd and shepherdess, um, the prince, uh, to Lady Happy. Um, so there's some really exquisite, uh, both prose and verse in it. Um, but I can't say, I'm not one, I feel it's a little apples and oranges, honestly. For sure. Yeah. And it, I feel like it's a little bit like um, Shakespeare's Much Ado About Nothing, if that also had long prose set pieces, right? Like it goes in and out of prose and poetry very deliberately, but typically when Shakespeare goes to prose, it's to do like quick witty banter and back and forth. And you have a lot of that in convent. And then you also have a list of what all the bedding will will look like in every single season and ever all the food they're going to eat, right? Like that really long list of all the pleasures, um, which is structured like 17th century prose, which, you know, God bless them, but there are monsters. 17th century prose is a nightmare. And it's all dependent claws hanging from one another and things like that. Um, and so I feel like those lo really long prose speeches are something that Cavendish uh, loves. She does it in multiple plays. Usually it's women telling you exactly what they think in these very um, complicated sentences. Um, and it's something that you don't get a lot in Shakespeare because when Shakespeare moves out of blank verse into prose, it's typically to do a, a quick back and forth. Um, so yeah, like that's the sort of difference in the quality of language, um, not quality in the sense of like good or bad, but in the sense of like what it feels like to speak it. Um, uh, we don't have the years of rhetorical training delivering oratories, sadly. Right. Um, and so it does uh, come out a little bit different sometimes. Thank you. Uh, we have two questions that um, sit in the same land um, by uh, Christina and Misty. Um, the um christina says i agree that this play worked well on zoom would you want to do it in person and if so how would it be different uh, misty adds to that what would a live production need to do to capture the cinematic and surreal qualities of the play so i think that's primarily a question for kim so that's one of the things um i mean i know we all had a discussion afterwards and was like it's a movie <laughs> a film that she wrote a film she was ahead of her time because you know the script also doesn't there's act one act two right and then there's scenes of but she doesn't put place she doesn't and she does there's a lot of like it feels like cut to or there's montage work that's happening in it um but i do i do think what is potentially exciting about it if there was you know if i was to work on a production about it would actually be the integration of media um, and also live camera work because there's something about this too that really wants to be supported with getting inside the way people are thinking and and seeing or looking at right there's something about the lens and how, what, what that is and each person's point of view that I think that the, the play can um, really support uh, uh, live, live media and actually some contemporary performance practices inside of it. Fascinating. Fascinating. Well, that sounds, that sounds well, exciting. Purists would probably hate it, but that's okay. <laughs> ah, well, purists need to. The purists haven't lasted with Red Bull anyway. Oh, is that um, right? I didn't know so, that. Okay. Um, or if they did, they're the good kinds of purists. Oh, yes. yes. Um, we have a question from um, uh, a great handle, Geek Home Sweet Home, um, <laughs> asking, how much is the list of things Lady Happy wants for her convent meant to seem unrealistic or instead utopian or a part of empowering women more generally? Who wants to take that one? I would normally hand that, but Kim seems so excited. Well, because it's it a real list. Because it's, it is a list of the things that she actually lost during the Civil War, right? 
Yeah, so Julie Crawford talked about this a little bit yeah. um, on the, the pre-panel, the pre-performance panel. Um, I don't think it is unrealistic. Like Cavendish uh, was in, in the process of rebuying all of those things for her residence um, after they get back to England, after the English Civil Wars. Um, her family home had been and um, uh, just absolutely destroyed, gutted. Uh, um, her the her husband's uh, properties had been gutted. Things had been taken from them. So the sort of list of luxuries are both things that she uh, was in the process of reacquiring, and also things that she was conscious of having lost because of the the civil wars that she had went through. What had she, she had gone through, right? Um, so what's different is not. Um, or what is unrealistic, right? Or what is uh, sort of fantasy in that, uh, in those opening setup scenes is not the list of property. It is the, um, uh, the idea of a female only community, right? That's the, the sort of dream vision, um, which then, uh, you know, raises the question if, the utopia relies not just on wonderful furnishings, but also on the ability to exclude men from your community, um, and that's your dream. Uh, does she think that that is the only way to female empowerment? Um, mm. I don't think she does because she had a very generous uh, husband. She had a very happy marriage as far as we can tell. They thought of themselves as intellectual equals. He is the reason so many of her books survived to the present. Um, he is the reason that she has books um, printed in the first place. Um, and so what is like, what is then prompting her to imagine this sort of all female space as uh, the only place where women really have a kind of freedom, I think is something that I still don't know, but I think about all the time. May I ask, um, well, <laughs> the, 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 the portrayal of the male characters in this play, um, uh, not, not just in, in the performance we did, but very much in the script, with the exception of this Princess Prince character, are very much of a type. Yeah. And, and there's a, 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 I think that, I guess I wonder whether or not she is railing against men of a type. Um, and, and which may in that time be most men. And that maybe the man who's willing to go in and exist amongst women and live a life with women and everything else and support and respect and trust women the way her husband trusts her. They may be one in a million, but they might be allowed in in their own weird way. I guess that was a very male centric take on it that I took while watching it was I was like, well, he or they are very, is very different from the other guys. Like they aren't misogynistic just after possession, um, see women as objects, people that there's, it, it, and I guess as me looking for like, what lessons do I learn as a, as a young male out of this? There were plenty mm. about how to go about treating women is you treat women like, well, without the deception, like the prince princess character and not like the others is like, there does seem to be at least some lessons being shot at men there too in that way. I guess that was my take just as the ignorant observer. I mean, I did not expect to come here tonight and hear a hashtag not all men, but... Uh, the minute I said it, the minute I said it. <laughs> um, I mean, I do think you're on to something though, right? And I'm thinking about, I'm just teasing you. Um, I'm, I think about it though, not in terms of like the characters, but it is, there is a really stark distinction between the inside of the convent and the outside of the convent, right? And I think that Kim did a good like, um, Kim, who, for anyone who doesn't know, was the one who chose all of the backgrounds that sort of slowly, you know, became colors as um, Lady Happy's vision was realized. Um, 
uh, there's a really stark distinction between the way things operate outside and the way things operate inside the convent, right? So um, outside the convent, there's that conversation with all the advisors where they're saying, you know, maybe we should put on dresses and try to sneak in that way. Um, and then they're like, no, 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 that will never work. We will never be able to raise our voices high enough. No one could ever pass. No man would ever get away with that. We're just so different. We could never curtsy in the same way that a woman could never put on breeches and make legs and, and make bows. Um, and so the outside the convent, or me, at least among that group of men, in that space, gender is completely unavoidable, right? Like you just can't, you could never pass. And then you immediately cut inside the convent where the princess um, comes in and instantly is like, I'm going to be a man the whole time. I hope you're cool with that. And everyone's like, cool, princess, have fun, right? Um, and so I think it's like, I, I think she is making a really stark contrast between the way that gender or maybe the way gender normativity operates inside versus outside. Um, and I, I think you're right about that. So there, I took away your hashtag, but um, justified your reading of the play. Oh, well, thanks. Thank you. I, I needed that. Um, <laughs> but the, um, uh, Lynn asks, and, and we did address it, but I actually do think she, she raises a very particular point that I think is worth uh, returning to, which is very similar to what we're talking about from Lynn. Did you already discuss the take on a possible homosexual relationship between the two women? Um, yes. But the second part of this, I'm actually curious if we have an explicit yes or no thought about, which is, was that an original intention of the play, do we believe, or do, or is it just something that we cannot help but see from modern day? Uh, with, uh, Liza, I, I, let's give that to you first, because you've lived with this script longer. Uh, so absolutely an original intention, right? And in fact, when my um, when my friend who I was like back channeling with while the play was happening said, you know, this play makes me think, this production makes me think that Lady Happy is in on it the whole time. Um, the, uh, I think maybe by the end she could be in on it, but there's that one scene in the middle where she comes out alone and says, I'm really worried because I find myself falling in love with a woman and that's not natural and i like i'm having trouble processing my feelings because it feels like what i feel for this person is not something that i should be that i a woman should be allowed to feel for a woman um and so it's definitely in the play itself where lady happy is is coming to realize that she is attracted to a woman and she's trying to figure out how she wants to deal with that um and it's also in the fact that madam mediator is constantly trying to split the two of them up right um she says to the princess you being around is making my my um my mistress, this person I'm supposed to care for, look pale. You're making her look unhappy. You are doing her harm. Um, and then when she goes out and talks to the men, she says they're kissing with more vigor than women should kiss. Um, and a lot of um, so there's there's Lady Happy sort of uh, worrying about herself and about her her sexual identity. There's Madame Mediator worrying about what is happening between these two women as she sees it. Um, uh, and so it definitely like I don't think we're reading into it if we say um, like big lesbian vibes in the middle of the convent. It, it does make me wonder, and Liza, maybe you can speak more to the period, the time period. Is this sort of like, <laughs> um, what, what was the recent um, Pixar movie three ago with the, with the merfolk, the two young boys? But is this sort of like, to, that was like very clearly a relationship about two young boys finding love for one another, but they couldn't make it explicit because then they couldn't sell it in China. Mm -hmm. Right. Is like, yeah, is, is, yeah. yeah. So is, is it possible that the, the, almost tossed off like yeah he's a guy of the prince is <laughs> is more just like please watch this play for these 80 minutes and then i'm gonna do these 10 minutes so that even in my closet drama form i don't get in trouble um is is it po like that feels bad wa watching it today but is it possible just like really thinking about what why it was written that way that she was just covering herself a little bit yeah, I mean, mm, 
it's not being subjected to censorship, right? Because there's lots of mm-hmm. stuff that uh, is being printed that uh, is very is very queer, right? Quite frankly, um, uh, so there's not like somebody banning it from the press. Uh, is there a form of like self censorship where she's like, mm-hmm, I don't know if if the play ends and there are two ladies together, will my husband think that I don't want him? Right? Um, mm-hmm. Is there some element of that happening? Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, I. I don't think that we're likely to find a manuscript version in which the princess is the princess throughout and then we discover the printer changed it at the last moment. Um, because it is like a, it's a full transformation at the end, right? And the moment that always really sticks out to me is when the prince says, uh, okay, I've been found out, I'm the prince, the ambassador is here, I'm busted. Um, ambassador go back to our home country tell everyone i've decided i'm going to marry this person and uh i will do it by force if i have to um right though i i will do it by force of arms if i don't get consent for it and it's not clear if that's her consent or the consent of this country um but it's it's not like a it, it's a it's a transformation of that character, right? Um, and the way that uh, I heard the actors figuring out what to do with that, with that sudden, like, it, it seemed really mutual. And then suddenly we have this, like, I'm going to come in with my army if you don't actually want to marry me uh, moment, um, was that uh, in, in their version, the two of them had fallen in love and Lady Happy was in on it in that moment, right? So... That's why you don't see Lady Happy being taken aback and be like, "Excuse me, sir," um, which which happened in some early rehearsals. And by the end, it was like, you know, I need to convince my ambassador that this is going to happen. But like you and I have already sort of agreed to this that channeled, um, uh, which I think is definitely one way of reading what's happening in that scene. But there's also a really kind of harsh way of reading what's happening in that scene as well, right? Um, so I don't know if that answered your question, but it does seem to me that it's not its not like a princess um, and the ES gets scratched off and then it proceeds, right. like some changes in, in the end of that play, right? Yeah, okay. You know, there was also something that Clotilde and I talked about, Clotilde Horn, who played Lady Happy, uh, and I'm, I'm mentioning it because Liza, you've you've brought up a couple of times, like was the princess in on it? Mm. And one of the conversations we had about her arc and her journey was that in in starting to feel these things, she was starting to feel things that I think she wasn't sure she was ever going to feel, or maybe wasn't sure she wanted to feel. And it actually being, yes, there's the speech about love for a, a woman, but I, but we talked about like sometimes, you know, she was also, her father had died, there's mourning, right? That doesn't get talked about at all. Um, and so what her process was to come to this awakening and these feelings of attraction and love and sexual attraction, for this person who was also meeting her intellectually. This is the other thing that that um, that, that character does, that the prince does, the prin- princess does, um, is that they see her. They really see her and they really get her and they read her. They read the book on her really well. Mm-hmm. And it, and the for me also the beauty of how Rami played that wasn't that it was a tactic to get the lady it was genuine that this was really in seeing her they were they were also coming from a a heartfelt place and so for Clotilde's Lady Happy at the end of the day the beauty is that she has arrived at a place of love for another human being, and it's not about the equipment. It's about the human being, if that makes sense. 
Oh, it makes perfect sense. And I also think it's a beautiful way, unless anybody feels strongly, for us to end this evening, because it does seem like it is about the human being at the end of the day. Um, and, and not the equipment, as you said. Um, and, um, and look, if there's a play that drives that point home, I think that that's a play worth, worth doing and exploring and talking about. And I'm so thrilled that we've been able to, and thank you both and, and Becca for your cameo Becca, um, thank you. for, for joining us this evening. Um, please do watch out. There'll be a few more things for Red Bull Online this season, a few more remarkable conversations and things like that. And we'll be doing some more readings in New York. And um, please look out for any other writings or anything that Liza is doing or directing that Kim's doing. Can um, I give a shout out? Um, America Moore, which is actually right behind me, which Red Bull produced at Cherry Lane Theater back in 2019, right before the pandemic. If you're in Cleveland or the area, we're going to be doing it at Caramel House in May. So come check us out. Um, it's a really, uh, it's a pretty spectacular play. Yes, please do. I, I believe Keith Hamilton Cobb is in our audience right now. Um, <laughs> our wonderful, the wonderful star performer of that um, and an actor. And, yeah. and if you want yeah. more Cavendish, Google Sorry. Digital Cavendish. We have lots of text up for free on that website and you can explore in her corpus at your leisure. Yes. Um, wonderful. And then also check out R18, the R18 Collective, which was what, the group that we did this in partnership with. And they have lots of scholarship on their website as well. So please do check that out. Um, have a wonderful rest of your St. Patrick's Day. This has been an absolute pleasure. And uh, I hope to see you all at Red Bull events uh, again soon. Have a wonderful night. Thank you, Nathan. Thank you, Red Bull. Thank you, R18 Collective and Liza. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye.